All right, welcome back to my channel. My name is Carly Stevens. This is Carly Stevens Books for all things writing, publishing, and indie author life. And I have Jenny Shank here with me today. I am so excited to get to talk to her. Um, Jenny grew up in Denver, Colorado, and earned degrees from the University of Notre Dame and the University of Colorado. Her short story collection, Mixed Company, won the George Garrett Fiction Prize and the Colorado Book Award. Her novel, The Ringer, won the High Plains Book Award in Fiction and was a finalist for the Reading the West Award. Her stories, essays, satire, and reviews have appeared in the likes of The Atlantic, The Washington Post, The Guardian, and The LA Times. One of her stories was listed among the notable essays of the year in Best American Essays. She was the Denver slash Boulder editor of the Onion AV Club and the books and writers editor of the newwest.net slash books, which was named the best literary blog in the Westward Best of Denver issue. She was a Mullen Scholar in writing at the University of Southern California and teaches writing in the Mile High MFA program at Regis University and Lighthouse Writers Workshop in Denver. She lives in Boulder, Colorado. So Welcome, Jenny. That was that was quite a resume right there. <laughs> thank you for thank you for inviting me on the show. Yeah, yeah well, this is uh, a privilege for me. I've I'm fascinated by the the breadth of your experience and how you've embraced so many different types of writing. So we're gonna focus on on the essays, the kind of creative essays mostly today. But how did you first get into writing um how did you when did you know that that was something you wanted to pursue so um before i could even physically write i was my mom would write down my stories for me when i was like three or four and mm -hmm. then i would illustrate them so i was always making stories um and then i remember in first or second grade we had a chance to publish a book in 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 our class where we would write the story and then we typed it and illustrated it and they taught us how to bind it with like cloth and tape and glue and then you had two copies of it um one you got to take home and one left in the library where other kids could check it out and so um it was such a, a rush to see some other kid checking your book out and then um i just kept writing i always wrote for all the school publications um, in high school, I was the, one of the editors, a sports editor for the newspaper, and I edited the literary magazine. And then in college at Notre Dame, I um, I started writing for the Observer, the newspaper there. And then just, I think I had published some things in some literary magazines there, and then it just, just kept going from there. Um, I, I didn't always know that I wanted to be a writer for my profession, but like I never stopped doing it and I knew it want, wanted to be a part of my life. And then, so in, in college, I majored in English and psychology and I did a semester in journalism. And by that point, I knew I wanted to um, write fiction and maybe I, I would be a journalist for a day job, which is funny because it's like not, <laughs> it has been rocky to um, maintain that as a day job. Um, I had one for a while, but mostly I've been a freelance journalist this whole time. Um, so um, just always juggling a lot of things and always writing. So you're not somebody who discovered this later in life. This was three-year-old you definitely knew that you loved telling stories and, and you know, entertaining people and all of that. That's... Yeah, I mean, before I even had, I can't even remember the thoughts, having thoughts about it before I started doing it. <laughs> I love, I must, I love stories and books and have a lot to express, I guess. So it's in your blood. So what is it that drew you to creative nonfiction? Because it sounds like, I mean, yes, you, you know, are a novelist. Yes, you've written short stories, but a lot of what you do is creative nonfiction. So what is it that drew you to that um, specifically? Yeah, it's, it's interesting to think about because I think when I thought about being a writer, it was always more towards fiction, but I had always been doing nonfiction, especially in my journalism endeavors. Like I had columns, personal columns in the newspaper in high school and also in the college paper. Mm -hmm. So I think that it sort of grew out of that. Plus, I was always into writing comedy pieces. So that's another thread of it. Um, like I was in the uh, comedy sketch group in college. 
And in that one, we had to perform. And that was pretty nerve wracking for me. I realized I like to write, <laughs> write the comedy better than uh, actually being up on stage with it. And so that's when, like probably in college or after college is when I started discovering like literary humor, satire, like things that were written for McSweeney's and places like that. And um, every once in a while I write one of those. <laughs> and, um, but creative nonfiction, I, I really love it. It's a genre of its own now. And um, whenever I have an idea, I mean, just a great way to, process something that happened to you um, if you have questions mm -hmm. about it still I think like the process of writing an essay can help you understand it better um, it can preserve like an, an interesting moment in your mm -hmm. past that you would otherwise slip away it also can help you I think um, just cope with things that are are difficult either I've done that either through just addressing something difficult in a straightforward way or through humor about it like um when my house was partially destroyed by the floods we had in Boulder about 10 years ago or I can't remember so many national natural disasters since then I can't remember the exact date but um out of that I got two different pieces one was that was published in the Atlantic called notes on a 40 year flood or 100 year flood. Um, it was just me trying to make sense of the confusing days in the aftermath of what mm -hmm. happened. And then another piece that was a comedy piece, I, I think it was published in The Toast, which was a great website that that's no longer um, around, but it was great. And it was just like a comedy piece about dealing with FEMA because there's so much like weird stuff that comes when you deal with FEMA. For example, you would go to the um, FEMA headquarters, like that they they set up temporary headquarters in the town that has a disaster, and you go there and it says FEMA on the door, and there's a guy you're talking to with like a FEMA hat and a FEMA shirt, and you ask him your question, and he'll be like, "Well, I don't work for FEMA," and I'm like, "But you have the shirt and the pen," and he's like, "We're just like contractors, so I can't answer your question." And they'll point you to a phone, like a phone that you pick up in the room where every like all the FEMA shirt people are are stationed and you talk you know you wait in the, in the phone line to talk to the person who's actually speaking for FEMA so there were so many things like that were so weird and funny that I had to I had to laugh about it so I made a comedy piece out of that too mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's helpful it's helpful to get um, the dis a little bit of distancing that comedy gives you the, the broader perspective to laugh at something um that's you know you're going to survive it and it's going to be okay so it sounds like a lot of it has to do with just tapping into your own humanity and your own experiences and making that accessible to other people in in a very concentrated kind of way that both hopefully helps them and also helps you if i'm if i'm yeah, mm -hmm. it's definitely reading yeah. you correctly. It definitely um, is. I want to help other people. A lot of my creative nonfiction arises out of just I just feel this instinct. I have to write about this. I guess it's the way I think about things is the writing, and I can't have a coherent thought <laughs> without writing something out of it. Yeah, I wanted to ask about the the process of getting published in some of these really amazing. Um, you know, well-known publications. You mentioned that you haven't really been on staff um, at, well, certainly not at all these places. You've been freelance mostly. So do you pitch a story idea and then start writing it? Do you pursue a story and then try to sell it? Like how, how does it actually work to be a freelance journalist as, you know, in your experience? Yeah, so um, that's a good question. I teach a whole class about this sometimes for Lighthouse and sometimes for Regis too. Um, so yeah, I was I was on staff at the Onion AB Club where I was an editor, and then I've been sort of like a regular contributor for book reviews at places like Rocky Mountain News, Dallas Morning News, now Minneapolis Star Tribune, and a few other places. Like they keep disappearing, but I keep trying to find new ones. So at those places. Um, it's mostly I'm writing book reviews, so I'll pitch in advance. Hey, can I write something for you? And it has to be like like three or four months before the book comes out. I have to find a list of books that look interesting to me, and I 
thrown by the editor and they're like, okay, you can do that one. So that's like really not hard pitching when you have a, a relationship. Um, for other things, um, the class that I teach is about how to craft a timely essay with a news hook, because that's really what mm. places like the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, they're, they're looking for something that's tapping into current events. Um, and they're mostly looking for something that's maybe in the range of a thousand to 2000 words. And it usually um, has a more focused point or something you're trying to convey. Um, if if you have more questions than something to express, I'm like, well, that might be a literary essay because I write, mm -hmm. I have more questions and just, I wanna have images and, you know, explore through those kind of poetic techniques. I'm like, that's gonna be a literary essay and it's probably gonna be, it might be longer. Um, so for most of these places, you have to write the entire essay first. That's, it's different for, um, most journalism pieces you do pitch you like have an idea and you pitch the editor and say may I write this but in most of these places for their essay writing section they want a complete piece and the same is true of almost all types of comedy because I mean almost whenever someone's like I wrote this really funny thing you're like no you didn't <laughs> let me be the judge of that so <laughs> so for most humor writing it's it's you have to write the whole thing first so it's interesting because there's it's like very different because it's a no-no to write a whole um investigative article or journalism article but it, but you have to for these personal essays and most of their guidelines can just be found on their websites there's also this really great website called the op-ed project Hmm. Um, because a lot of it, it just gathers the guidelines from um, newspapers all over the country what they're looking for and oftentimes like I think some people think of op-ed that's opinion editorial they think oh that's a place for political opinion or, or something like that I don't do that but really um, that's where a lot of the personal essays are um, hmm. And they would rather have <laughs> something personal and with good images and, you know, engaging language than, you know, just another um, piece that feels like it's somebody, you know, did a focus group and is writing this opinion piece. So that's a good place to break in for uh, personal writing. You do for those things, you do have to have some kind of a point. Um, and oftentimes you have to um, state some sort of hook or um, what you're going for in the very first paragraph and then you know res with a conclusion whereas um, literary essays can be much more free form you don't have to like come to a conclusion you don't have to have like a, a thesis that you're that you're stating but for a lot of those um, newspapers you do and um, when I when I teach my class I'm like sometimes you something will happen to you and it's in the news and you're inspired and you can write it really fast and get it out in the news cycle um that's a little hard because they move on really quick you almost have to send it in the day or or two that it happens but the other thing i tell people is that oftentimes like if something happens to you it's going to come up again so write you know explore what what um this experience means to you and then the next time that something like it enters a new cycle you'll have it ready and you can just mm -hmm. add that little bit that makes it current um and the the places that I, I talked about I didn't have any connection at all I just kind of like threw it in there on a whim because I was like why not and most of them say they'll get back to you within I think it's one to three days and they really do like if they want it some places won't respond if they don't want it but um like the Atlantic I think got back to me a few hours later and, and same with the Washington Post when I did it which is a very different experience compared to literary writing where it's like years um so I would just say you know give it a try make sure you meet their guidelines make sure you have a point and some kind of news hook and give it a try and I've done a lot that haven't gotten accepted too but um, sometimes I can repurpose those. Like, uh, like I was really moved. I love the Nuggets and I was watching all the playoffs and the championships. And I just felt like there was something distinctive about their teamwork. It went beyond teamwork. It was like total selflessness. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a piece about it and I tried to pitch it to some of those places that are like op-ed, but no one got back to me. But then I just, um, I put it in my own 
newsletter, the tumbleweed, because I do like kind of an essay every week, every, not every week, every month, <laughs> every month. And um, then it got picked up by um, another place that some people that liked it and reprinted it somewhere else. So, um, I mean, you just, you never know if you're moved about something, just write it, see what happens. It doesn't always work out, but you, I mean, you shouldn't pre-reject yourself. You should just hmm. throw it in. <laughs> and I really like that. I, I don't feel bad anymore about like especially throwing my work into some anonymous um email address or like you don't even feel the rejection it feels worse like when you know people and like for example I've been invited to submit you know to literary journals sometimes and then you get rejected and that feels like oh no <laughs> that's not as good but just throwing it into an anonymous um submission process doesn't bother me so you just have to do it a lot and sometimes things work out I like that. Don't pre-reject yourself. Yeah. Just follow those passions and and uh, sometimes pieces will just find a home, a different sort of home. <laughs> Nobody picked up your nuggets piece. Yeah. I, as a fellow Coloradan, am, am horrified by that. I feel I like was, it's a great topic. Yeah, I was thinking about it after, especially because so many people responded to it once I did publish on my newsletter and once it did get republished. And I think it's because so many of the major um, publications have a staff sports writer. And mm -hmm. so, and like a lot of places don't have any staff <laughs> anymore, but they still have the sports writer. So they don't really want outside people because that person is writing their essays every week. Um, so that was my insight. I'm like, okay, people still have staff sports writers and they don't care about <laughs> you. <laughs> and I guess, I guess not. Um, so would you mind walking us through what you have found since you've done so much writing, you've taught this um, kind of writing before, what are some of the elements of great creative nonfiction and where, you know, if anywhere, do you see overlap with great fiction? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question because I just got done teaching for Regis. Um, my workshop this time was a mix of nonfiction and fiction people together. So I had to come up with lessons that applied to them equally. And so there's definitely um, certain things that that both fiction and nonfiction can have in common. For example, importance of creating um, a great character, um, including if it's if it's you. And you have to put yourself on the page as a character. Um, there's a great uh, essay by Philip Lopate. I think it's called The Importance of Writing Yourself as a Character or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's about how you're never going to capture your whole self in a particular essay. I mean, we're different people at different times in different places. So you mm -hmm. figure out who you are. If, if it's a memoir piece, like for that time period, for that essay, and get yourself on the page with, with great detail. So, mm -hmm. I mean, character is one thing in com common. Working in scenes, um, a lot of the uh, primary nonfiction markets that people are like aiming for, like, like let's say everyone wants to get published in Modern Love, this column in New York Times. Um, and they, like in their requirements, they're like, you must write a scene with character, you know, all these things that are traditionally thought of as fiction elements. Um, and an essay needs to have tension of some kind, just like fiction does. And it, there needs to be some kind of shift. It doesn't have to be like a huge epiphany or um, a massive change in your characters, but you do have to have a shift that something has changed. Like that is the point of the essay. The interesting thing about nonfiction though, is that you're not required to work that way. Nonfiction to me seems like um, there's so many possibilities because you can do something that's more research based or you can do weird things like just write a list of stuff, you know, a list of like a funny list that's considered nonfiction, I guess, but it's um, it's its own form. So you don't have to always work in character and scene and, and things like that, like you do in fiction, but oftentimes those are used, but you can you can add more other things in. Oftentimes, um, people that like to write something that's more research-based and philosophical will find that they can draw more readers in if they add a piece of that um, in-scene writing that's like instantly gripping to readers. Mm -hmm. So kind of mixing in and matching the techniques. 
um, is really helpful. Right. It can make it more memorable and personal. And yeah, I, I teach very specific kinds of nonfiction, not these uh, sorts of uh, like magazine style articles that, that we've been mostly talking about. And the main connection that I've found between at least the kind of nonfiction that I talk about, so college essays, literary analysis, that kind of thing, and then novel short stories is specificity, is is being specific and grounded in interesting detail. So that's that's usually what I tell my I wrote all over my students' work was specificity, detail. Good. Be Good. specific. <laughs> If there's any student of mine listening, it's not just me. <laughs> no, I mean, even yeah. all of us can be more. And even when I'm writing a draft where I don't have that specific detail, I'll like put in brackets, like be more specific next time. Like keep going, but you know, you know, you have to do better when you come back. Um, but some of my students um, that came from that context from only having written essays in academic context were like, mm -hmm. Wait, I thought an essay was like this five paragraph thing. And I'm like, no, it can be anything. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually more fun when it's not following those rules that you've learned your entire school career. Right. It's more like jazz than, mm -hmm. <laughs> than Baroque. All of a sudden you can do so many more things based on what the need of the story is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, um, so I I read a couple of your pieces. Um, and they were they were beautifully specific. I had a very good sense of who you are. It was interesting that you said make yourself a character, not in the sense of of making something up, but making yourself really appear on the on the page. And I saw that in your work. Um, so if you, I, I would love you to to describe, if you wouldn't mind, um, how you balance creativity with truth because nonfiction it's meant to be you know you're you're not making things up like you would for a novel or, or something like that so how do you how do you balance those two elements in say a piece that you've written yeah um I was thinking about what what I should talk about for this and um I have this essay that I just published I've been working on for a couple of years called three wishes and it just came out in hunger mountain review on their July issue of the online issue and it's about um something I've been thinking about like for my whole life my when I was like about nine my grandparents lost their family farm to bankruptcy during the farm crisis and um you know I loved the farm I loved playing there I didn't really understand what was going on at that age or like why why what's bankruptcy all all that um and I wanted, and it's always kind of been in the back of my mind to think about it. And then um, what actually what prompted me to write this, and this is good sometimes, like there's a, there was a magazine called Ecotone, which is really wonderful. And they just had a call for entries on the theme of gardening. Um, and I was like, oh, I'll try something for this. Cause I love, I love to garden. And so when I was thinking about it, I'm like, like well, my my love for growing things goes back to my my family's history of being farmers like as far back as we can remember and so I started building this essay that turned out to be a braid between um, an account of my grandparents life and their farm and how they lost it and me in my garden and when I was writing it it was during um, the pandemic lockdown and I had like turned towards my garden even more because like all my friends were there, the butterflies and the hummingbirds and the frogs. I mean, that's the friends I had during the lockdown. And um, so I put these two things against each other, um, like my love for gardening, but my fear of like what happens when you try to farm, like when you make it matter too much, it kind of has mm. to be, um, I think my first line is something like, um, the you should never um, burden your gardening with any specific hopes. It should be general hopes mm -hmm. for things to happen, but not specific this this many tomatoes or this many this, because that that to me turns it more towards farming, which is so tenuous and um, mm -hmm. prone to failure. And so um, 
as far as blending the fact and the artistry of this, um, I did some research, like um, my my grandmother or my aunt had recorded a lot of my family story in a family cookbook that we she published in like the early 90s, maybe. So I was researching that and I found um, some material about uh, Czech, my family's Czech, Czech farmers in Nebraska from the University of Nebraska, like someone had done a dissertation. Um, so I found some of that and I like combed my memories and combined it with like verifiable facts and, you know, interviews or, or people I, I talked to about this to construct the, the part of the story that was the historical part about what happened. And then the creativity comes in, um, in, you know, in the descriptions of what's going on in my garden and in the way you talk about how everything made you feel. And I think that that's what maybe most distinguishes creative nonfiction from other genres. Um, I've talked to people that started out as poets and people that started out as fiction writers and all, and then also did creative nonfiction. And they all feel that there's a greater burden on creative nonfiction for you to do some more telling, you know, versus showing um, more telling because people come to nonfiction to not just like, what happened, but what did it mean? How do you feel about it? Much mm -hmm. more so than other literary forms where sometimes the story or the image or the language can speak for itself. Um, you don't have to, and it's not that you need to provide a moral um, or anything in creative nonfiction, but it's like, I wanna see you grapple with it on the page, grapple with it, because that's what I'm here for. Um, I'm not just here to know, you know, the facts of what happened. Hmm. That sounds like a, an interesting piece. I'm not a gardener myself, but, um, but I always love checking out other people's <laughs> gardens and seeing what they're able to, to do. It's, it, it's, it impresses me. Um, so how can people find you and all of your whole body of work online? They're not overwhelmed by it. Sometimes I look at them, <laughs> I've just been like frantically doing these things for so long. Um, <laughs> so my website is uh, jennyshank.com. And I also have my, my newsletter, The Tumbleweed. Um, and that, I think it's at, I wrote it down, jennyshank.substack.com. Or you can just look for The Tumbleweed, Jenny Shank. Um, and that has like every month, I'll just share like whatever book reviews I did, you know, it'll be an inner, it'll be, um, some essay on some topic. And then I also have my assorted whimsy. It's like stuff that made me laugh that month, month or something that was weird. And then I'll share like, I often writing book reviews. So I'll share a little bit of my book reviews and then just any other news that, that goes on. Um, and so that's a good way to, to dive into all the million things that I've done. <laughs> all right. I will put those links down below if you're interested in um, tracking all that down, learning more about Jenny and her work. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for talking with me today. This is not an area that I am certainly, I'm certainly not an expert in it, let's put it that way. And so I, I feel like I learned a lot. Hopefully, everybody watching did as well. Um, so make sure to subscribe for more content like this, like this video if you like it, and I'll see you next week. Bye.